All right, I see all the important pulmonary peeps are on. So uh, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, excited today to have a uh, grand rounds um, with Dr. Dubowski, and I will turn it over to Dr. Levin to introduce her. Thanks, Dr. Thomas, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, we're joined by Dr. Catherine Dubowski, who received her medical degree at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She completed internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Columbia University before making the big move from the west side to the east side of Manhattan to continue her training in pulmonary and critical care medicine here at Mount Sinai Hospital. She served as chief fellow in her final year of training before accepting a position as assistant professor in the division of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. She is currently working on a number of COPD-related initiatives, including serving as a co-lead of the COPD Care Standardization Committee for the Mount Sinai Health System and two COPD-related clinical trials. She's an outstanding clinician and medical educator who many of our residents have had the good fortune to learn from in the medical ICU and on pulmonary consults, and we are very happy to have you here today, Dr. Dubowski. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Hopefully that is visible to everyone. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about COPD, something I'm very passionate about. And I'm going to jump right in with the talk, which is entitled COPD, the gold, the bad, and the ugly. So to start, I have no disclosures. And the objectives for this talk today, I'm going to work on helping everyone understand how we define COPD by the gold guidelines and identify the limitations of this definition. We're gonna implement guideline-based treatment for patients with COPD and then identify COPD resources at the Mount Sinai Hospital. So first we'll start with defining COPD, then we're gonna jump into classifying COPD and why that's important, then into treating COPD, and lastly, the COPD resources. So let's get started. Why should we care? Every good talk has a good uh, obligatory epidemiology slide. So for us, this starts with thinking about the numbers about COPD. So COPD was the third leading cause of death worldwide with 3.23 million deaths in 2019. This is according to WHO data from 2021. They're a little bit behind, but you know, a little known respiratory virus came by after 2019 that has changed the statistics a little bit, but this is the most up-to-date data we have from the WHO. In the United States, we have that COPD, according to CDC data, is the sixth leading cause of death um, in 2020 with over 150,000 deaths. And if you um, did the math, that's one every four minutes. So the gravity of this situation is really important. And maybe the most important bullet on this slide is this one, that COPD is underdiagnosed and underreported. And therefore these statistics are grossly underestimating the burden of disease that we have both nationally and internationally. So in order to really talk about what COPD is, um, I want to introduce you to a patient of mine. Her name is Emmy Zima. She is a 66-year-old woman. She's a former smoker, 40-pack year history. She has daily shortness of breath. Her exercise tolerance is really only a half block, and it's limited by her shortness of breath. She has daily cough, productive of clear sputum, and unfortunately, she has two to three exacerbations per year. I'm going to show you some spirometry. For some folks, it's probably been a really long time since you've looked at these numbers, so we'll just take them a little bit slower for the first pass. Um, the FVC is the forced vital capacity. In some ways, that's about how much air emizema's lungs can hold. And when we're looking at any patient spirometry, we're comparing it to a reference value, which is determined by other patients who uh, are her height, her age, her gender, because we know that these things will impact the, quote, normal lung function that a patient could have. So we're going to compare her to this reference value to understand where she falls in the spectrum. So when we looked at her forced vital capacity, we saw that she was able to hold about 2.61 liters of air and the reference of 2.66, that puts her at 98% predicted. So that's great. She's right in that normal range. 
When we look at her FEV1, however, which is her forced expiratory volume in one second, what we see is that she can actually only breathe out 0.6 liters of that air in one second. And the reference value for you to understand where, how severely reduced that is, is 2.11 for a quote, normal person like her, which puts her at a ratio of 29%. Lastly, we look at the FEV1 over the FVC ratio, which we can see in a normal person is about 80 for her, but in this patient is uh, 23. So I also have included her respiratory flow volume loop here for us to take a look at. And again, if you haven't taken a look at one of these in a while, here's a normal loop for us to compare to. So the bottom is the breath in. These are similar, nice and smooth. When we look at the breath out in the normal loop, you can see that this is a nice curve that falls in this gray bar, which is the normal range. And that for her, she's so far below that normal gray average or normal range that we can't even see the top of it, but this is her loop here. So next I'd like to propose a question. And um, I think that we're very tech savvy these days and I can actually re release this poll for you guys to quickly answer. Maybe a poll has popped up on your screen and if it has, go ahead and answer, does this patient have COPD? We have yes, no, or I'm not sure, but I appreciate the patient's name. Give everyone a moment to fill that out. There are a lot of pulmonologists on this call, so they're skewing the data a little bit, I think, but all right. So if I end this poll, and share the results. I think you guys can see that we've got the majority saying yes, a small percentage saying no, and a couple of I'm not sure. Great. So we'll get back to the answer on that shortly, but I'd like to introduce you to one other patient first. So this patient's name is bronchitis. She's also an active smoker. Um, or rather she's an active smoker. Emizema was a former smoker, but this patient is a one pack per day smoker. She also has daily shortness of breath, cough with daily sputum. She walks slower than folks her age, her peers. And she actually had a flare of her breathing about two months ago that required a course of prednisone. I'll show you her spirometry here. When we look at her FVC, we see that her predicted 2.54 liters is 90% of the reference value. So that's pretty good. That's in the normal range. When we look at her FEV1, we see that her number 2.09 is 94% of the predicted. And her ratio is uh, 82, uh, FEV1 to FVC was 82 or 0.82. So you can see her um, flow volume loop here. I've put the normal flow volume loop for comparison. Actually looks pretty similar. She looks like she's got a, a loop that more or less parallels what this normal loop looks like. And so with that, I am going to try to put our second poll up for everyone. Hopefully another poll has uh, popped up about Miss Bronchitis. And I'd like you to answer, does this patient have COPD? Yes, no, or I'm not sure, but it sounds like she should probably quit smoking. Great. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead, still a couple of stragglers coming in with answers. I'll go ahead and end the poll to show everyone where we are now. So here we've got a majority or, or uh, the largest percentage saying no. Um, and then a bunch of I'm not sure's. Quitting smoking is always a good answer in a pulmonary talk though, don't worry. And uh, does this patient have COPD? 22% said yes. Great. So. That's a great jumping off point, and we will get back to the definite answers for these folks shortly, but I will now go into what is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So the um, Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, which is the GOLD guidelines, defines COPD as 
a common preventable and treatable disease, which is something that I would say some of us don't often think of when we think of COPD, but characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms, airflow limitation that's due to airway or alveolar abnormalities, usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. It's kind of a mouthful, but I wanna drill down a little bit deeper so that we can really think about this definition. So there's three core components to this definition. Airflow limitation, which is defined as a post-bronchodilator, meaning after having received albuterol or maybe epitropium, um, FEV1 to FEC ratio of less than 0.7 or 70. And um, it also must be a patient who has respiratory symptoms, which could be shortness of breath, chronic cough, sputum. And lastly, the, the definition involves an exposure history. So for a lot of our patients, that's tobacco exposure, whether it's firsthand or secondhand exposure. And we should really be sure we're taking that secondhand smoke exposure history when we talk to our patients. But in a more broader context, we need to think about other potential toxic exposures. So for folks, especially internationally, who have different cooking fuels that they're using, asking about those potential exposures, asking about work and hobbies and different particle inhaler um, inhalants that they might be exposed to in the work that they're doing, and lastly, pollution. What's really important here is that emphysema does not come into the definition of COPD by gold guidelines. And I think that's a really common point of confusion for patients. When they come into my office, they say, well, I have emphysema, so I must have COPD. Emphysema is a radiographic term for smoking related changes that you see on a CAT scan, but it's not actually part of the gold definition. And there are pluses and minuses to that. And I think one of the things that we need to consider is that if we're thinking about COPD defined internationally, that not everyone has access to CAT scans to be able to prove that a patient has emphysema on imaging. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. So let's review our patients. Emmy Zima, in terms of exposure, she's a former smoker. She has symptoms of daily shortness of breath, daily cough with sputum, and she's only able to walk a half block and that's limited by her breathing. And lastly, for her airflow obstruction, she in fact does have an FEV1 FEC ratio of less than 0.7. So she has COPD. But what about bronchitis? So she is an active smoker, so that's her exposure. Her symptoms are daily shortness of breath, cough with sputum, she walks slower than folks her age, but her FEV1 to FEC ratio is not less than 0.7. So by these criteria, she does not have COPD. Great, so bronchitis should go on living her life, smoking her cigarettes because she doesn't have any risks. Do we have to worry about what might happen for bronchitis in the future? Yeah, actually we do. So the COPD gene um, authors, they're a group that were working on a COPD gene cohort where they followed patients who are current or former smokers over many years. And we're looking at these different pieces of their um, history. They were looking at their exposure history. They were looking at their current symptom burden. They looked at their spirometry and they also looked at CT imaging. They had over 8,700 patients enrolled in their cohort, and they followed them over many years. And they actually found that there were differences in outcomes for different patients that we may actually need to incorporate into the way we think about COPD. So this is a busy slide, but I think it's important. So I'm going to take a moment to walk you through it. On the left, you can see the different classifications of each category and what their exposure is. So in the first group, we have those who are just exposed in this group, in this cohort, by being current or former smokers. They don't have, as you can see by these other categories being white, CT findings of emphysema, they don't have abnormal spirometry or symptoms. This group is considered the reference group for the cohort. These are smokers who don't have any other symptoms. They're considered our reference. And then every row below this will show you a different combination. So exposure with CT imaging findings, exposure with symptoms, et cetera. And what they found was that in these 
other groups, even if you didn't meet full criteria for COPD, you had an increased risk of a change in your FEV1, so a decrease in your lung function, and also an increased hazard ratio for all-cause mortality. And if we look at where our patient bronchitis would fit in here, we see that she's in row E. I didn't tell you that she has emphysema, but she does. And when I look at her in this column, I see that she has an increased risk of having a lower FEV1 and an increased risk of all-cause mortality. So that's concerning. And what they've proposed in order to uh, reconceptualize this is that instead of those strict criteria that we're using with gold currently, that we should probably start changing the way that we think about COPD, that an incomplete definition of COPD still might put you at possible risk of COPD, a possible COPD, a probable COPD, or a definite COPD. And that what basically their, um, their study showed was that with a strict definition by gold criteria, they only had about 4,000 patients included in meeting criteria for COPD. But when they expanded it to include possible and probable, in addition to the definite COPD group, they found that there were an additional 3,000 patients who potentially would benefit from monitoring or treatments to try to uh, limit the risk of decline in lung function and mortality in these patients. So takeaways so far, we know that COPD is a common preventable disease resulting in significant morbidity and mortality throughout the world. We know that the gold guidelines define COPD as airflow limitation in patients with exposure to toxic particles who have respiratory symptoms. And even symptomatic patients without airflow obstruction can have worse lung function and increased mortality when compared to symptom-free smokers. So we should maybe focus a little bit more energy and think going forward about how to incorporate studies examining how to treat these patients and manage these patients in the future. So that was a lot of information about defining COPD. I'd like us to jump now into classifying COPD and why that's important. So standardizing COPD classifications requires three pieces of information. The first one, degree of airflow obstruction, then looking at the symptom burden that the patient has, and lastly, their exacerbation history. So let's go into these in more detail. Once you have established that the patient has obstructive lung disease with an FEV1 over FEC less than 0.7, then you're gonna look at the severity of their reduction in FEV1 as a way of understanding um, how severe their COPD is or their gold staging. So for an FEV1 of greater than or equal to 80%, that would be gold one or mild disease. If you have an FEV1 less than 30% predicted, that would be very severe. And that's actually where our patient, emizema fits in. She's gold four. Next, I want us to talk about the symptom burden. So um, I wish I could take credit for this graphic. My stick figures don't look nearly as nice as these, but um, this is a graphic that I found on a blog showing um, one, a graphic illustration of one of the symptom scales that we use to understand where our COPD patients are. This is called the MMRC dyspnea scale. It's the Modified Medical Research Council dyspnea scale, much easier to say MMRC. And what it shows is that there's grades zero to four, grade zero being you only get out of breath with uh, strenuous exercise, like this patient playing tennis, or grade four, you're so dyspneic that you really can't leave your house. Our patient actually falls in this grade three category where walking on level ground, just a, you know, a block, half a block of exercise um, on the street makes her winded and have to stop to catch her breath. I'll just briefly mention that the CAT, the COPD assessment test, is another tool that is like this MMRC that you'll see in the guidelines for assessing symptom burden, but I won't go through that in detail today. After we go over symptom burden, we have to think about exacerbation history. So that involves the number of exacerbations that the patient has in a year, and also whether or not they're getting hospitalized because of those exacerbations. So what is an exacerbation? This is something also I think we should take a moment to discuss. So I want you to think about change as the way to define exacerbations. 
So first off, a change in symptoms. So this would be more dyspnea, more coughing, increased sputum. That's above and beyond normal day-to-day -day variation that a patient might experience. It's acute in onset. So it's an acute change in symptoms. And it's something that's going to cause a change in your treatment plan. This patient's going to end up getting for example, prednisone, nebulizer treatments, a step up in, in their inhaler therapy. So this is how we think about an exacerbation. And frankly, this is rather frustrating. I wish we had a biomarker that we could just do a lab like a BNP or something like that and know for sure whether the patient is exacerbating because you can see that these are um, somewhat subjective, that there are other diseases that could also be causing these types of uh, symptoms like a pneumonia or a heart failure exacerbation. So it's not a perfect system, but it's the way that we're defining exacerbations currently. So once we have all that information, we're going to plug it into this graphic to be able to understand the next steps for our patient. And this is a lot, but we've already gone through all of this. So we've said that they're they meet a criteria for obstructive lung disease, and then we're gonna look at their FEV1 predicted to understand the grade of their COPD. And lastly, I want you to focus on this piece in the corner, which has an X and a Y axis. The X axis here is the MMRC or CAT, so that's our symptom burden. And then the Y axis here is our moderate to severe exacerbation history. That's looking at how many exacerbations per year and whether or not they required hospitalization. So if we were to plug emizema into this staging, she's gold four, like we said, with her low FEV1. And because she is very symptomatic with an MMRC of three and has had two to three exacerbations in a year, she falls into stage D. So what do we do with this information? That was a lot of work that we had to do to, to label her. Why bother? So um, why do we go through the mental gymnastics here? And, and it's multi factorial, but two main reasons that I want you to take away. The FEV1 exacerbations and symptoms predict outcomes. Outcomes is very vague, I know, and in part because different pieces of this history will give us different pieces of information. The graph that I've, I've shown you here on the right shows how FEV1 predicts survival, where stage one COPD in this graphic represents an FEV1 of greater than 50%, stage two is 36 to 50%, and stage three is less than 36%. So you can see a very clear difference in survival based on the severity of your FEV1 uh, reduction. But FEV1 is actually not a predictor of exacerbations or symptoms. And so with that information, we need to add those pieces in order to understand um, what the likelihood is that our patient is going to end up in the hospital with an exacerbation and know um, what the next steps are for that patient. I'll briefly mention that there are other indices like the Bode index, which I'm not going to have time to go into today, but is another way to measure um, some of these key pieces of information to understand outcomes like predictions of exacerbation and mortality. The second piece of the puzzle, and this is where I think the money is really, is that this information of staging our patient will guide our treatment. Okay, so an additional summary to keep everyone moving forward, we've now defined stages of COPD require um, degree of airflow limitation, symptoms, and exacerbation history. These components predict mortality and risk of future exacerbation, and they're going to help guide our treatment. So let's go right into treatment. All right, hopefully you're all with me. Got another busy graphic, but some of this is stuff you've already seen. Here on the x-axis, we have the MMRC and the CAT score again, and here on the y-axis, we have the um, exacerbation history. And yes, here are our groups. So our initial pharmacologic treatment is just completely based on what symptom, what letter the patient receives when we stage them for COPD. In the group A folks who are not symptomatic and not exacerbating, these folks may benefit from a short-acting beta agonist or a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, but generally they're not very sick and they're doing well, so we just can offer that for symptom relief if they need it and just continue to monitor them. But you'll see that in the other three categories, 
we have uh, llamas, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, as part of the backbone of treatment. So I wanted to use this opportunity to briefly just mention why pulmonologists are so obsessed with llamas, not these kinds. You know what I mean. So we have the UPLIFT trial, which is one of the very well-known COPD um, trials, which enrolled almost 6,000 patients and randomized them to receive either placebo or teotropium, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, and followed them for four years. On the right, you can see that the probability of exacerbation in the teotropium or solid line group was less than the placebo or dotted line group. And that was a difference that worked out to, um, I believe, a 16% reduction in exacerbations. So that's really great news. And we'd love to reduce exacerbations in our patients. It also showed improved quality of life and some benefit for lung function, but that was a little bit more nuanced, but that was enough for pulmonologists to say, okay, we should definitely include the long acting muscarinic antagonist um, in treatment for our symptomatic and exacerbating patients. Group D gets a little bit more complicated though. Here we have additional uh, treatment options that are offered, including the inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist option. And frankly, it's not infrequent that a patient walks into my office and they're on an inhaled corticosteroid and long acting um, beta agonist combo inhaler as the treatment of choice for their COPD, which is always interesting. So I like to look at the data for why we would do that. So that's actually the TORCH trial, which enrolled over 6,000 patients, and it randomized them to one of four categories, either a combo inhaled corticosteroid long-acting beta agonist, an ICS alone, a LABA alone, or placebo. It followed these folks for three years, and it showed that there was a 25% reduction in exacerbations, which is great. It gave them a number needed to treat of four in order to prevent one exacerbation. That's fantastic. At that rate, I feel like everyone should be on this medication. The graph that I've shown here on the right from that study is actually showing that there's also some reduction in the decline of FEV1 in folks who were on combo therapy as compared to solo, ICS, or LABA, and placebo. So why is everybody with COPD not on an ICS LABA? And that's because there was also a 49% increased risk of pneumonia in those receiving inhaled corticosteroids. That gave them a number needed to treat of a number needed to harm of 17 for every case of pneumonia. So that is definitely something that we need to understand better to know how not to harm our patients when we're using these meds. Fortunately, the guidelines have reviewed a lot more of the studies that have been done around this question and have provided us with some very clear um, recommendations. So in the strong support box, we have folks who've been hospitalized with COPD exacerbations, so severe exacerbations, with two or more exacerbations a year, even if they don't require hospitalization. Those who have elevated blood eosinophils, and that's actually because of data that shows that this subphenotype of COPD that has um, a more inflammatory response with elevated eosinophils, that those folks may respond better to inhaled corticosteroids. And lastly, folks who have concomitant asthma, because asthma as an inflammatory lung disease does seem to respond better to inhaled corticosteroids as well. So those are the patients that we should encourage the use of an inhaled corticosteroid. There's also this against use box that's really important for us to consider. And that's those who've had repeat pneumonias. If you've had recurrent pneumonias, this is a treatment that we should make sure you're not on because it's only increasing your risk of future pneumonia. If you have very low eosinophils on the blood, then you may not respond to the inhaled corticosteroid and it may just put you at risk of pneumonia without the benefit. And those with a history of mycobacterial infection also are not recommended to be on an inhaled corticosteroid. So that brings us back to our initial pharmacologic treatment and we can't forget our patient emizema. She's like we said, group D. And when I saw her, I started her on a llama and I continued to follow her up, hoping that getting her started on controller therapy, I'd see a reduction in exacerbations. 
unfortunately, she's still exacerbated. So how do we step up therapy for our patients who are symptomatic? And we also have a great guide, a roadmap for how to do that. There's two types of the continued to be symptomatic patient, those who are dyspneic, but not exacerbating, and those who are having frequent exacerbations. So emizema falls into this category, and I'm going to focus our energy here. After starting her on a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, she was still exacerbating. I added the lava to see if that would help. And she actually had eosinophils, blood eosinophils, when she was not on prednisone of about 200. So after she continued to exacerbate, we added the inhaled corticosteroids. So she was on triple inhaler therapy. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to control her symptoms and she was still exacerbating. And thankfully, this enabled us in this step up algorithm to consider one of two medications as additional therapy for her. So let's talk about those. First, we have riflumilast. And I promise this is, I think, the only biochemistry slide. So I'll just take you guys through the mechanism of riflumilast because I think it's helpful to understand why we use it. It's a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. And what it does is it blocks the breakdown of cyclic AMP. When cyclic AMP is increased, we have three beneficial effects downstream. Inhibition of fibroblasts, which slows uh, remodeling and fibrosis in the lungs, bronchial smooth muscle relaxation, and inhibition of inflammatory mediators. And those downstream effects are that that down regulates macrophages and neutrophils, which we know are um, and unfortunately a part of the pathology in COPD. So the REACT trial is a study that enrolled nearly 2,000 patients with severe airflow obstruction with chronic bronchitis and at least two exacerbations per year. So this is actually my patient, emizema. And, it, and you can see these are severe patients who are, um, who, who are not well controlled despite their uh, maintenance inhaler therapy. They're randomized to reflumilast or placebo, and they're followed for a year. So this graphic on the right shows you that placebo in the blue bars, reflumilast in the red bars, that we see a reduction in severe exacerbations and exacerbations leading to hospitalization. Um, and that reduction was a reduction of 13% less exacerbations in patients. So great news and a great option for patients who meet these criteria. The next medication that was in that pathway is azithromycin. So um, the, the way we think about what azithromycin is doing in the lungs is that we know that it's an antibacterial. So by blocking bacterial activation, we have some benefits there. We also know, especially I think early in COVID about some of the anti-inflammatory properties of azithromycin. And um, that works in blocking a leukotriene chemokine pathway that helps reduce the amount of um, neutrophil migration into the airways. So the study that one of the studies that looked at the use of azithromycin was called the azithromycin for the prevention of COPD exacerbations. Missed opportunity here. If they would have asked me, they should have nicknamed it the APE study, but they didn't. So we've got the whole title here. Um, this is a study that looked at over 1,100 patients. It randomized them to receive azithromycin or placebo and followed them for a year. And what you can see in the graphic on the right is the proportion free of COPD exacerbations that the azithromycin in the blue line had less exacerbations than the placebo group with a number needed to treat to prevent one exacerbation of 2.86. So that's also a pretty good um, option for patients who uh, meet this criteria. This begs the question though, which of these two options is the better option for our patients? Is it reflumilast or azithromycin? And to date, we don't have an answer to that question. There has never been a head-to-head -head trial, but actually right now we're um, the Reliance trial, which is the reflumilast or azithromycin to prevent COPD exacerbation. Somehow there's enough letters in there that that spells Reliance. Um, that is under enrolling patients right now, and Mount Sinai is actually a site enrolling patients in this study. To, to randomize patients to either daily azithromycin or daily reflumilast, and then look at their frequency of exacerbations to see if one of these is actually a better option. 
So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have more information about this in the coming months. All right, so we're back to our um, pathway for escalating treatment. Emizema has gotten all of the triple inhaler therapy. Then she's gotten reflumolast, and unfortunately, she is still symptomatic. So she comes back to my office and she says, Doc, I am, I mean, there's nothing left, right? You're at the end of this algorithm. I'm just going to be symptomatic like this forever. And the answer is no. There are some advanced therapies for COPD that have been, um, that are worth discussing. And I don't have time to go into them really in detail, but I want to just mention them so you know that there are more options. So a bolectomy would be a surgery to remove a large uh, bolus, a bulla, if there is a patient who, for whom that might be a predominant problem causing their symptoms. In the same way, a surgical lung volume reduction is a surgery that actually takes out a diseased portion of lung if it enables the uh, a basically removal of the hyperinflated or very overexpanded unhealthy lung to allow the healthy lung to then further expand and participate better in gas exchange. Both of those are surgical procedures. In pulmonary, we're very excited that we've started to uh, do more of the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And that involves actually not a surgery, but doing a bronchoscopy and placing valves into the airways of the dis more diseased lung to reduce those so that their normal lung can expand and it has the benefits of not being a surgery with the surgical recovery. Um, I will tell you, I didn't have time to include the slides uh, during the talk, but if you have more questions about this, I'm happy to answer them. Emmy Zima actually did undergo bronchoscopic lung volume reduction because she was an appropriate candidate based on a number of factors. And uh, she had an incredible improvement in her symptoms. Her FEV1 increased and she was able to walk farther and feel much better. So that was a really great option for her. In the biologics for COPD, there is uh, some data about the use of anti-IL-5s like mepolizumab and venralizumab, which have shown in certain patient populations with COPD that there may be some benefit for reduced exacerbations. Um, but this has not really made it into guidelines or mainstream treatment yet. Uh, we're also hoping to start enrolling in a new clinical trial for COPD uh, biologics and COPD in the next couple of months here at Mount Sinai. So that'll be another opportunity to investigate an additional treatment option for our uh, symptomatic COPD patients. And lastly, we must always consider the possibility of lung transplant in patients who have quit smoking and are um, in that category of severe lung function, uh, severely reduced lung function who are symptomatic for whom a transplant may be life-changing for them. All of that to say that these therapies are available for very select patients, but because most of the folks on this call are not managing that like super specialized person. And because really this is the crux of treatment for COPD, we should talk about the non-pharmacologic management. Vaccines, I cannot say enough how much time I spend in my office trying to convince patients that vaccination is the most important thing, aside maybe from smoking cessation, that they could do for their health right now. Getting vaccinated against the flu, pneumonia, and COVID helps reduce their exacerbations and is it's like a no-brainer, but it does take time to convince some of my patients that it's worth it. And I think that's really way more valuable than uh, talking about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with them. Smoking cessation, um, absolutely essential for our active smokers and that smoking, vaping, whatever um, you know type of alternative they may be using currently. Um, we have a smoking cessation clinic at the Mount Sinai Morningside site. So for folks who need a little bit more um, attention and focus on that, that we're able to send, send folks there. Low dose CT screening is not a recommendation just because you have COPD, but because so many of our COPD patients in the U.S. are smokers, it's important to remember that this is something you have to consider for your patients. If they meet criteria for lung cancer screening, which means that they are a, um, a former smoker or current smoker, uh, 
for current smoker or former smoker who've quit within the past 15 years, if they have at least a 20 pack year smoking history, and if they're between the ages of 50 and 80, you should consider that they're the candidates who should get screened for uh, lung cancer screening with a CAT scan. Pulmonary rehabilitation is also integral to the treatment and improvement in symptoms and exacerbations in our uh, patients with COPD. And uh, during the pandemic, it was actually very hard to get uh, these treatments for our patients to get them into pulmonary rehabilitation programs, but some programs are opening up um, throughout the city. And we have a program here at uh, Mount Sinai that we've been referring folks to as well. So we're very fortunate to have that as an option to help our patients work on um, symptom management and uh, strength exercises to reduce their symptom burden. Supplemental oxygen and non-invasive ventilation are also important to mention as um, treatments that are needed in certain patients who have desaturations or hypercarbic respiratory failure as a result of their COPD. This image, I think sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think this picture really is so important for this talk. I borrowed it from the London Respiratory Network and that's why everything is in pounds, but I didn't think you needed the dollar equivalents to understand what they're trying to say here. So they're using quality adjusted life years, which is a measure that looks at the quality and quantity of life lived in order is like a value metric for the treatments that we're offering. And you can see that the flu vaccine is like the biggest bang for your buck. This is the thing that they're saying, and this graphic comes pre um, COVID. So, you know, assume that slash COVID vaccine and pneumonia should also be in there, but that vaccination, stopping smoking and pulmonary rehabilitation make up the base of this pyramid. I talk so much about llamas. They're not even at the bottom of this pyramid. So before you even start talking about starting uh, regular inhaler therapy, we should make sure that we've covered the base of these three pieces of the pyramid. So additional takeaways up until now, thanks for sticking with me. We're, we're making our way through this talk. We have patients who are symptomatic benefit from at least a llama. Inhaled corticosteroids are not for every patient, but in some patients really can be beneficial. Use guidelines to escalate therapy for your patients, and then consider reflumolast or azithromycin for patients on maintenance therapy who continue to exacerbate. And most importantly, don't forget the non-pharmacologic basics of smoking cessation vaccines and pulmonary rehab in your patients. So lastly, onto the bullet of the resources that we have at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. So as was mentioned in the intro, I have the privilege of being uh, a part of the COPD care standardization committee across the Mount Sinai health system. We have representatives from all of the Mount Sinai hospitals, and it's a really unique opportunity because we have to understand the unique needs of each hospital and the diverse patient populations that we serve, and then understand the workflows that are in place at those hospitals and establish protocols that work for everyone to really ensure that we're giving the best care to our COPD patients. And we then try to analyze outcomes to understand how we're doing and then target areas for improvement so that we're constantly working towards improvement. This is a old screenshot of the COPD dashboard that I just wanted to share with you, which is one of the tools we've created and use, which enables us to look at how many exacerbations have happened in a month and some of the outcomes we follow, like their readmission mortality to understand uh, more about that population. And then some of the pieces at the bottom are pieces that we think are integral to taking care of these patients, whether they've received steroids, if they needed antibiotics, um, if they had inhaler teaching, et cetera. So the next step is to identify the patients in real time. Now that dashboard is retrospective data and we actually have access to these fantastic resources to provide for patients while they're admitted with COPD, but we have to be able to identify them on admission or during the hospital stay in order to share those resources with them. And that's been a little bit harder than I thought it would be, but we're working on a couple of initiatives to identify patients in real time. And one of the ways that we are doing that is through an order set, which I'll show you in a second. 
But just to talk about what those resources are, we are very lucky to have a COPD program manager who's a fantastic respiratory therapist, and she is able to provide bedside education to patients, understanding and assessing their understanding of the disease and trying to fill in gaps for them, review inhaler technique, perform bedside spirometry when it's appropriate, ensure that they get connected to pulmonary for follow-up and refer them to pulmonary rehab. So it's really, we're so, so lucky to have her. Um, this is a picture of that order set. So we're helping our frontline providers um, to order the meds that are appropriate for a COPD exacerbation and also um, reminding them to include things like nicotine replacement therapy if it's appropriate for the patient. Um, so this is just screenshots of what that order set looks like. And lastly, we're working to ensure a safe transition from the hospital to outpatient follow-up. We acknowledge that a lot is lost in that discharge from the hospital to follow up. And this is especially concerning for our COPD patients where, for example, the um, there was a prior authorization required for the inhaler we wanted to start or the copay was prohibitive and the patient couldn't purchase it and therefore ended up back in the hospital with another exacerbation because they weren't on the therapy we were recommending for them. So we're trying to create a safety net to make sure that this is a safe transition out of the hospital. And that is an ongoing effort. We've been meeting with the stakeholders to create a multidisciplinary approach with pharmacy, respiratory therapy, with our case managers to really um, work together and, and the providers and frontline providers to come up with a plan that ensures that the patients are getting access to everything for um, a safe transition out of the hospital. So final takeaways. Um, the talk was COPD, the gold, the bad, and the ugly. So the gold, COPD is a disease defined by gold as exposure, symptoms, and airflow limitation. The bad, this definition excludes patients with symptoms who do not have airflow limitation, but still have worse lung function and increased risk of mortality. And the ugly, it's a little bit of a stretch, but don't let your management of COPD patients be ugly. Stage your patients, use the guidelines, and step up your patients' treatments for guidelines to ensure that we give them the best possible care. Just a quick note of thanks to Dr. Powell, Dr. Dua for their help guiding the COPD um, efforts in the hospital and, and for the help with preparing this talk. Dr. Harkin, Dr. Chada for their expertise in interventional pulmonary and Dr. Rurek for his help naming our patients today. So with that, I will happily take questions. Thank you, Dr. Dubowski. So there are some questions and comments in the chat. I can... Where they start? Um, so there was a question about when would you add the three times a week uh, azithro, but I, I don't know if you want to comment more on that. I know that came in just before you started to talk about it. Yeah, so the azithromycin definitely is a good option for folks. The subgroup analysis of the uh, use of azithromycin shows that there are certain patient populations that benefit more. So former smokers, uh, those who are older, over the age of 65, um, those who are on oxygen, I believe, I'd have to go back to look at the study, but there are definitely some patients who see uh, clear benefit and then um, current smokers, the data actually does not necessarily support the use of azithromycin. Um, There's a question asking the, the difference in cost to patients between um, the azithro and the roflumonest. That is a fantastic question. And there unfortunately is a big difference in cost. Reflumolast is significantly more expensive than azithromycin. Um, and so that sometimes does factor into the decision about which medication that we're going to use for folks, or we prescribe reflumolast and the patient comes back and they tell us they couldn't, they didn't start it because they couldn't take it, which is unfortunate because if we would have known early, we could have just switched them potentially to azithro if it was appropriate, but um, there was also a direct comment to me, and I appreciate the note that I did not specify that the spirometry I was showing you was post bronchodilator, which is essential to the definition of uh, defining obstruction. So thank you for that. It, the, we're assuming that those were post bronchodilator, but I should include it in the slides. Um, what else here? The, the, the one from Dr. Greenberg. Does Does the, the, 
Yeah. Does the rate of decline in lung function have any role in following patients or evaluating response to treatment? Also, does the type of microparticles less than 2.5 microns make a clinical difference? Both really great questions. So I have to look a little bit more at the data of how the rate of decline of lung function may impact treatment response or um, we do know that some of the treatments can improve the FEV1. So for example, um, the teotropium study actually showed that folks had an increased FEV1 in comparison to placebo, but they both had the same trajectory for continued decline in lung function over time, because we know that as we age, our lungs will get older and lung function will decline for everyone. So we did see some benefit in FEV1, um, but the rate of decline uh, continued. The um, other literature that's looked at I, uh, ICS LABA also showed that there was some benefit in FEV1, but we don't really use those measures as a way to say that the patient has had benefit from treatment and should continue it or has not had benefit from treatment. And therefore we should stop that treatment because um, even if we don't see improvement in FEV1 or um, a slowed rate of decline. If the patient is not as symptomatic or if they're exacerbating less, we would continue that treatment. Um, microparticles, uh, the pollution literature is really fascinating and it's part of the reason why I am interested in COPD. The PM 2.5 or that measure of that size particle, we know um, ha has the ability to get into the you know, smaller areas of the lung and infect the small airway and impact the small airways. Um, I don't know specifically um, how I would answer that question about, does it make a clinical difference? I think, yes, different exposures at different particle sizes will impact the lungs in different ways, but PM 2.5 definitely has the ability to impact the small airways and um, the development of COPD. Um, is the COPD care management education available for inpatient services at all Mount Sinai hospitals? Great question. Um, we have our respiratory therapist here at different sites. There are different um, pieces of support in place. At Beth Israel, there's a pharmacist who serves a similar role, and we're currently working at the other sites to really establish similar um, specialists who can serve the primary education role and roll out this discharge package so that when patients at any hospital in the Mount Sinai system are um, discharged, that they have the same amount of education and support in transitioning into the outpatient setting. That's the last question I have, unless anyone sent you some just to you. I got a couple of direct messages here. Let me see. So um, Dr. De La, De La Hose is asking about the importance of doing spirometry in all smokers in primary care, which is a really great question. So um, I think it it's a little bit, it depends on who you ask and what camp they're in. Um, I think we probably could be using spirometry more as a screening tool if you're a smoker, but you're completely asymptomatic. Um, there's pluses and minuses to doing spirometry to understand what your lung function is. I would say that as a pulmonologist, I think it's a relatively um, easy test that can give us a lot of information about your lung health and educate the patient about things like, this is where your lungs are now. And if you're a current smoker, maybe we should work to quit smoking, use it as motivation. Um, and I think anyone with symptoms who is a smoker should absolutely be getting spirometry, but the asymptomatic smokers is a little bit more about uh, pluses and minuses. Um, The, uh, the formal guideline for asymptomatic patients is not to screen, but I think um, sometimes when you're talking to patients, you can think about what makes the most sense for them, especially, like I said, if they have symptoms. All right. Um, another question about 
wearing masks. Since we've been wearing masks for some time, has that reduced our exposure to pollution particles? So while I am not in, uh, caught up on the, on the literature reg regarding pollution, um, my suspicion is that it definitely has reduced the, in the inhaled particles that we're uh, exposed to when we're out and about wearing masks. We definitely see that it has decreased our COPD exacerbations in patients who are less likely to be exposed to viral particles and maybe other irritants in their lungs. So that was a, a small benefit for the COPD folks, though I will also say a lot of my COPD patients say it's really hard to breathe with their mask on. I'm sure a lot of us are hearing that uh, from our patients as well. Um, okay. There's another question about how to teach patients about daily seasonal air quality indicators and their lung health. This is also an area that I think still needs a lot more work. So there's a number of faculty, even in our division uh, here at Mount Sinai, who are looking at air pollution measures, indoor and outdoor air pollution, and the impact that it has uh, more specifically in asthma, but of course it can impact our COPD patients as well. And I think there is still a lot that needs to be done, one, for us to understand what those risks are, and then to educate patients about them so that they know what measures to take, whether it's air purifiers, whether it's opening the windows or closing the windows, because on days when the uh, environmental air quality is poor, actually trying to minimize your exposure to that time inside might be a better option. But there are some ongoing studies in that vein that hopefully we'll be able to elucidate that as well. There's, there's one more comment here where we can finish up that uh, microparticles are more than size. Also type of particle might be important if you want to comment. Yeah, that is a very good point too. It's not just what the size of that particle is, but what that particle is and what the implications are when it's uh, interacting with lung tissue. So not just how big it is, which is another important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Great. Well, with that, I want to thank you for the terrific grand rounds today. Great review of COPD. Very nicely done, as Sakshi is saying on, uh, on the chat to everybody with her claps. <laughs> so thank you, Catherine, very much uh, for today. And, and have a nice day, everybody. Enjoy. Take it easy. <laughs>